Good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure this evening to have with me in my virtual living room uh, Dr. Antonia Ruppel of the University of Munich, Ludwig Maximilian University of U Munich. Um, what we're going to talk about today is her book, The Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit, uh, published in 2017. Um, that is uh, one of the well standard textbook for Sanskrit these days. Um, and before we talk about the book, let me briefly introduce Antonia to you. She did her PhD in Cambridge, at the University of Cambridge in 2012. Her thesis was published as a monograph with Cambridge University Press as Absolute Constructions in Early Indo-European. After her doctorate, she became the Townsend Senior Lecturer in Greek, Latin and Sanskrit languages at the University of Cornell, uh, where she was till 2014. After that, she changed and became a school teacher and was head of Sanskrit and teacher of Latin and Greek and Sanskrit at St. James's Senior Boys School until 2018, after which she became a research assistant at the University of Oxford in the project Uncovering Sanskrit Syntax and is now a lector in Sanskrit at the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. Uh, welcome, Antonia. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> and thank you for that for that very succinct introduction. I think I'll have to write that down and use it myself. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so uh, just to give everyone a brief bit of context, um, I'm currently working at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. And one of the seminar courses that I'm giving there talks about the pedagogy of language teaching, specifically of language teaching with ancient languages. Um, and accordingly, I was very interested to uh, peruse Antonia's book on Sanskrit and compare it to other readers and other textbooks. And I have a couple of questions and conversation points that I would like to talk to you about, Antonia, if that's all right. Absolutely. Ask away. Wonderful. So maybe we'll start with the basic question that uh, anyone who writes or reads a, a textbook on ancient languages is going to ask themselves. Um, what made you write a textbook on Sanskrit, although so many existed already? Um, necessity. I was teaching Sanskrit at Cornell, as you mentioned, and I just found that although there were a number of, of Sanskrit um, textbooks out there, um, most of them weren't really um, answering the questions that my, my students were asking or, or addressing the things that my students had, had um, issues with. Um, and I found that, um, so I was teaching Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, and um, for Latin and Greek, my classes were fairly homogeneous, but with Sanskrit, I just had a huge variety as far as student background was concerned. And so I had people who, you know, were classicists and interested in comparative linguistics. Um, I had, in, you know, I had Indo-Europeanists, um, but then I also had people who were doing uh, anthropology, who were doing Indian history. I had people who were originally of Indian extraction, and um, who wanted to learn Sanskrit to basically reconnect with their roots. So, you know, uh, physicists, engineers, uh, basically the whole breadth of, of, um, of the academic spectrum. And um, many of the things that um, the books that I was using at that point or that I knew at that point, what they did, um, just weren't ideal for my students, let's put it that way. And so I just started um, putting together lots and lots of little things on my own, just, you know, sort of handouts or a chapter about this topic and that topic. Um, and then I talked to um, a friend of mine who I still knew from, from my days in Cambridge, um, who said, oh, by the way, I know that the, um, uh, the religious studies editor at CUP is looking for someone to write a Sanskrit textbook. And so I thought, ooh, um, I mean, it would be lovely if I didn't have to constantly, you know, photocopy or print whatnot my various resources. And I would love to put together a book um, and just complete everything that I've already got. Um, and so that's then what happened. Um, and basically what I tried to do was write a book that um, doesn't require any knowledge of a foreign language, um, you know, or any experience learning a foreign language, but that at the same time, um, it makes use of um, the fact that all of us already speak a language, you know, if, if you're using an English language textbook, so a, a textbook written in English, you probably already know English. And so when I teach you um, about a new concept in, in Sanskrit, um, so for example, you know, endings or something like that, then I can show you these are the endings that English has. This is how what English usually does instead of using an ending. And then I, you can see, oh, I already know this. 
and I just need to need I just need a little tweak, and then I get what I'm what I need to know for Sanskrit. And so I try to make use of people's existing knowledge, and I try to use my own knowledge of um, the language background, the language history, whenever that was easily usable um, and useful for the students. I would insert um, an explanation of why you have these seven different things on the surface, you can actually explain them by going back just a little bit in time and saying, you know, this is how this um, apparently chaotic picture um, originated. So I try to get them to understand things, which then means they need to um, memorize less. So those were basically the principles. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. You've already touched on two other questions I'm going to ask. One is about pedagogic principles um, mm -hmm. and the other about uh, sort of the role of linguistics and language in general in your textbook. Uh, but before we come to that, let me ask you about something else that you've mentioned, um, the various constituencies of your classes. So their backgrounds in anthropology or religion or classics mm -hmm. or linguistics. Um, to what extent do you think did you want to or were you able to um, include sort of these backgrounds or pieces of interest for all of those backgrounds in your book? Was that at any point something you wanted to do or is it just something that potentially came about as it were? Um, I think the, tr the thing that I was able to, and the way in which I was able to address the, the you know, the everybody's background was by really not expecting any prior knowledge. Um, so there's a, there's a, um, a sort of traditionally used uh, book um, that when a Sanskrit textbook that when it um, introduces the imperfect, um, at some point says, no to the augment. If you learn Sanskrit after you've already learned ancient Greek, then that is all you need, you know, note the augment. Oh, they use the augment as well. Excellent. However, for everybody who doesn't live in the sort of 1880s, um, uh, they, you know, they, there's a good chance that they don't know ancient Greek. And so you just need um, more background knowledge. You cannot take anything for granted. You need to, um, you know, start from zero with whatever you do. And so that is, I think, a way in which I was able to address the fact that, um, uh, you know, I have no idea what background people will have. There's a good chance that they won't have any language background, any linguistic or language learning background. And then the other thing that I did was um, I felt that, um, uh, so in a number of language, ancient language textbooks, you won't really get to see any actual ancient language excerpts, ancient language texts. Um, for the whole duration of your introductory course. So whether that's a year or three semesters or whatnot. Um, and on the one hand, I can understand every author who, who, um, who sort of structures their book that way, because if you write all the sentences and all the sort of um, translation exercises, then you can um, gear them towards these are the words my students know, these are the grammatical concepts they know, and I won't include anything else in the sentences or in the translation exercises or whatnot. Um, and I felt that while that is very sensible, it is also, I felt a little soul destroying because most of us learn an ancient language so that we can read texts in those ancient languages. And even though I, at this point, am okay writing things in Sanskrit, I am definitely not a poet. I'm definitely not, not an artist of this kind. And so I tried to introduce um, um, original texts from as early as was humanly possible. Um, I stole the idea of how to best annotate them from the textbook Learn to Read Latin, um, which I used for Latin teaching. Um, this is um, Russell and Keller, Yale University Press. I can wholeheartedly recommend it. Um, and so I introduced these texts from fairly early on. Um, and I introduced a, a sort of a large variety of texts trying to, you know, meet the different people's different interests. And then um, basically the last quarter of the book has as its reading as its its, its readings um, books one and two of the Bhagavad Gita, simply because that is something that I have felt many people are interested in, no matter what their exact background is. Um, and so I'm hoping that by choosing by having chosen this particular text, um, I will have created um, a you know. Um, uh, a, a sort of a reading experience that is appealing for as many people as possible. Yeah, thank you. Would it be fair then to say in, in summary that what you were aiming for in choosing this particular approach was something approaching realism when it comes to sort of reading language in the sense that, you know, we will always read texts in which some construction, some vocabulary is either un, 
common or unfamiliar to us. And so yeah. learning to cope with it is important uh, as something to be taught quite early on. Um, that was uh, basically you are putting as a, as a virtue something that in, uh, at least in origin I uh, perceived um, you know as a as a different shortcoming or as a problem because you know you have to annotate um, uh, uh, grammatical constructions you have to annotate vocabulary however it's exactly as you said I found that people who um, have learned Sanskrit with my book and at this point you know it's it's been out. Um, it's been out and the, the PDF that I used to teach from before it was officially published, that those have been out for a while so that there's actually people, you know, who've gone through the whole process on the basis of this book and are now quite good. Um, they, I think, felt that their early experiences just reading continuous texts was um, I won't say pain-free, but a lot less painful than um, com uh, comparative experiences that they had with other languages um, where they just hadn't really um, dealt with this kind of situation with this kind of problem of requiring some kind of commentary some kind of notes because when you encounter a language that was written for native speakers or was composed for native speakers it won't always follow the rules of some grammar written in the 1970s exactly wonderful well let's come back then to another point that you've made earlier uh, you mentioned that you um, use english in an english-speaking textbook to demonstrate or to illustrate features of uh, Sanskrit or any other language um, mm -hmm. or rather to demonstrate that English has similar features while they're just used slightly differently. Um, something that one might or that has been called the sort of comparative method in sort of language teaching uh, quite to the irritation of any linguist who thinks of the comparative <laughs> method as something quite different. Um, slightly so, different, yes. Yes, ever so slightly. Um, so in that vein, uh, were there any um, pedagogical tendencies, any pedagogical principles or approaches that you uh, pursued or that you were trying to adhere to in writing or conceptualizing your book? Um, I think I, I, I touched upon this earlier. Basically, I tried to maximize understanding in order to minimize the need for rote memorization. Yeah, so basically show people, um, I, I personally find, I mean, from my own experience as a language learner, um, if I understand why something is the way it is, I don't, then I will remember it a lot more easily. And even if I don't touch that language for a couple of months or a year or something like that, I th these are the bits that I will retain. Whereas bits that I had to just rote memorize, um, they are much, much less likely to stick and they will stick only if you constantly apply them. Um, and that of course is one of the difficulties of learning a highly inflected language such as Sanskrit or, or Greek or Latin, that there is just so much stuff that you simply need to rote memorize. I mean, there isn't really any reason why a dative case ending looks the way it does. It's just something, you know, you sort of binge learn um, and then you apply it. And if you've applied it long enough, it sticks. So um, try, and, try and allow people to make sense of things as much as possible, which of course is a bit of a problem um, in the sense that um, the, the native Indian grammarian tradition, which is extremely sophisticated, extremely longstanding, extremely successful, um, basically does kind of without that. So Panini, the, the grammarian um, who kind of froze, classic, uh, froze Sanskrit in time, um, he never says why. He just says, this is the way it is. And um, now, you know, here I come, um, a European, um, uh, you know, sort of a gory, uh, white, white skinned person saying, aha, but I think I know how to do it better, which of course, you know, is a, is a fair amount of arrogance. Um, however, I hope that basically what I've done with my book is um, uh, provided a, a something that will complement these, um, you know, the, the um, approaches to Sanskrit teaching that we get traditionally from India, because for some people, these are going to work extremely well. Some people, and I have, you know, I have, I have uh, in my classes, I have students who often ask me, can we take a step back, you know, just independently from, from why it works that way, can you just give me the bit that I need to memorize? Yeah? And someone like that would probably be better off learning in the Indian tradition, where all you're told is, this is what you need to know. Um, and so I'm hoping that um, because these people I think are well taken care of. I have offered something that goes in the other direction and says, well, if you want to understand why this is the way it is here in you know, sort of slightly smaller print and in gray rather than in black is the explanation. Um, and sometimes the expl explanatory bits even make it into the, into the main text in regular size and black printing. <laughs> 
Um, and that's for the bits where I think that um, it's, in my experience, understanding the background is just going to help pretty much everyone. Thank you. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I would personally entirely agree that rules are not useful on their own unless you give some explanation to them. They just don't stick as nicely um, as if you can actually understand what's going on. And at the same time, we have to uh, admit that your perspective has been is very enlightened and humble to say that you know the, the road memorizing is um, perfectly plausible as well. And of course, um, as we from experience know, we have to address the the audience that we've got. So the kind of student um, that needs explanations is a different kind of student per chance that um, wants to road memorize absolutely everything. And, um, and I think, so when you say audience, if I just, just briefly add to that, um, you know, the audience, a traditional Sanskrit learning audience would, ha would be children, you know, that they, they would learn at, start learning at a much younger age. And um, um, I mean, I still remember those, those wonderful days where I could look at the list of things and just remember them, you know, after, after, after a couple of minutes. Um, whereas in, in the Western world, many people who start learning Sanskrit are adults, um, you know, college age or older. Um, and I think for them, my approach often works better and often also in the in the western world i mean sort of the english speaking euro american and so on um uh, we don't have a very strong tradition of of memorization so i memorized the odd poem in school but not very much and if you are from a tradition that you know has you memorizing things on a regular basis um then just memorization may very well be the way to go yeah and that is, I think, partly, as you say, uh, not only a geographical, but also a generational question to an extent. Yeah. Um, and one of uh, literature versus orature, so where sort of oral poetry and such traditions are far more alive than they are in, in Western Europe. Yeah. Um, so coming, coming back to um, the, the sort of pedagogical aspect and specifically now to Sanskrit, um, mm -hmm. in teaching, in learning Sanskrit, is there something that you would say is special or particularly difficult or uh, different from other languages. You've already mentioned the sort of the vast amount of endings and sort of inflections that one needs to get one's head around. Um, and apart from that, maybe, is, is there anything else that sort of mm. you think is special? Um, due to the very unusual history of Sanskrit, um, uh, there are a couple of things that are different, you know, from uh, other ancient literary languages, for example. Um, so, um, as, I, as I mentioned, Panini, the, the ancient grammarian, um, basically wrote something where I'm, I'm still not, I oh, and I think we, in general, are not quite sure whether it was meant to be entirely descriptive or also to a certain extent prescriptive. So he described the language that he found um, partly spoken and partly even written in, in, in the Vedas. Um, and what uh, he then said, you know, these are the rules. And what happened was that the people who, who followed him, you know, in time, um, they then followed the rules that he was describing. So they took his grammar as, as prescriptive. And Panini lived between the sixth and fourth centuries BC. And ever since, um, Sanskrit has been written using those exact rules. So, you know, uh, in, in, in ancient Greek, you've got, you've got a similar phenomenon that you've basically got the, you know, you've got the, 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 the pure, the written language, the katharosa, and you've got the dimotiki. And the dimotiki is always sort of the, um, you know, is, is always looking back a little bit and is, is always slowed down in its, 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 its development a little bit by the pure linguist, uh, by the pure literary language. Um, and so you've got a little bit of that, but in Sanskrit, you've basically got the, you've got the extreme version, which is that there is no, you know, sort of atticization or anything like that going on. Someone trying to go back to what Greek was like in the fifth century BC. No, Sanskrit simply is um, this, 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 this language that follows the rules that were um, set down in around the fifth century BC. And so you have these basically 2000 plus years of literature that use the same language, that use the same linguistic rules. And um, if that is the case, then a language, you know, you've got these, these texts that are much older, that are, you know, 300, 400, 500, 600 years old, um, that as long as they're just, you know, um, passed down, as long as there is a tradition and that keeps them being alive, um, uh, you have a huge body of, um, uh, sort of nicely polished literary production um, uh, in the language in which you're writing. 
And so um, if you are trying to then, you know, put your own stamp on things, um, one of the ways of doing that would be using words in non-traditional ways. So um, compounding in Sanskrit is a phenomenon that's, that's huge and that's partly because it's one way in which you can play with a language without violating Panini's rules. Um, and another way is that um, words are semantically extremely, um, uh, ex extremely sort of widely usable. So a word that can mean, you know, a cover can then be used for any kind of cover that you can think of. So um, it can be anything from the, 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 the cover of, of, of a, I'm not sure of a book, but um, you know, the, the cover of, of a pot, of a, of a wardrobe, of a, of a house, um, of um, a sort of cover in a, in a temporary, in an abstract sense. It can be, you know, a piece of clothing, anything that somehow covers or conceals can then be described by this particular word. Um, that would be just be one way in which these words are ex semantically extremely broad. So when I teach Sanskrit, um, I basically try to keep people away from dictionaries as long as possible, because when you read, when you see a Sanskrit dictionary, rather than just the vocab list that I give them for their first year, um, then you see a simple word and, you know, it has 40, 50 di different meanings, some of which seem to have nothing to do with each other. And um, that is something that as a Sanskrit student, you then need to be introduced to um, ideally gently. I like to do things gently. Other people sort of believe in throwing people in at the deep end and for some that works. Um, uh, and so that would be a very important feature of, of learning and teaching Sanskrit that you're aware that, you know, this is, this is different from what black students will have encountered with their own language or with other languages they've learned. Um, and then you try and find ways of introducing them to it gradually as best you can. The other thing that you mentioned is the huge amount of um, uh, endings, number of endings that we find, so highly inflected languages, that's always the case. We still have that in, you know, um, Slavic languages, um, uh, Baltic languages, so modern Indo-European languages have the same, they have the same situation. And so what I'm doing there is um, I always encourage people to make flashcards, but for everything that they might possibly need, I have made a set of electronic flashcards that they can use on Brainscape, on Quizlet, um, and then I know that at least one person has exported them so that you can use them on Anki, um, simply because memorization is just such a very important part of, the, of, of learning the language that I want to make that as, as non-time consuming as possible. So rather than having them prepare these cards individually, um, I make them for them. And if someone feels that they want to have their own printed cards that they've prepared themselves, they can always still do that. So those would be the main things I can think of. Clearly a very engaged and kind-hearted teacher that you are uh, for preparing <laughs> such material. Wonderful. Um, shall we mention that your book also has a website? Um, mm, yeah, cambridge-sanskrit.org. Very good. Um, and I believe that what you can find there are also um, video introductions to the various chapters, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. So uh, what I did was... Um, basically, because I know that um, Sanskrit is something that actually quite a few people are interested in learning who are not in a traditional academic or sort of school context. So um, interest in Sanskrit is big in the in the in the sort of um, in communities of in Indian extraction. Um, then there's a huge interest in the in the yoga community among um, people who are interested in Ayurveda. There's um, Indian astrology is something that quite a few people are interested in. And so um, if you don't have, really have the possibility of attending attending a regular Sanskrit class, then you need something to replace that. And basically what I tried to do was um, to create all the resources that are needed to come as close as possible to replacing a standard classroom environment. And so the videos that I made, which are, which are very bare bones, I mean, they're basically PowerPoint presentations that I've narrated over, but basically they are what you would get if you were in a regular classroom with me. And I I'm writing things on the board and explaining the things that I've just written on the board. Um, and then we go on to the next bit, which, you know, isn't me erasing the board, but instead it's the next slide. And then I, you know, say something about that slide. Um, and so uh, that's also actually what I use um, for my teaching here in Munich at the moment, you know, because we're all doing long distance teaching. And I find it rather... Um, uh, I, I find it boring and difficult um, for, for, you know, for the student side to um, just listen to me lecture 
um, live synchronously on, on, on Zoom. So what I do is um, I ask them to watch the video, which they can do whenever they want, wherever they want, whenever their internet is working, they can um, interrupt it, they can um, rewind it as often as they want. And then um, I use my, my actual classes to answer questions, do exercises and so on. But anyway, the point of the video is to basically get me talking at you, me standing at the, not at the, not at the blackboard, but in front of the, 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 the PowerPoint and talking at you. Um, then I have all those flashcards um, on those various sites so that you can um, memorize, do all the memorization more easily. And then I've also got um, a, a Facebook group um, for people to ask grammatical questions in, which is, it's, it's a big group. I think it's cl got close to 2000 people in it, but very oh. few people ask it, use it for asking questions. Most people want to ask, use it to sort of post their um, ide strongly ideological Sanskrit-ish related links. So there's not very much going on in that group, but there are a couple of people who regularly do use it to ask questions. And the last thing that I'm doing is um, if you're learning a language on your own, um, then one of the main difficulties is pacing yourself because either you ask too much of yourself and then you're frustrated because you can't get to the point where you want to get to. And then, you know, the next time you want to sit down, you feel that, oh, it's just too much work and you don't do it. And then you stop or you ask yourself uh, to do too little and then you're just frustrated by how slow your progress is. So one thing that a teacher really is important for is setting a certain kind of pace. And so what I'm doing is a course that's free and once again, very bare bones, where basically I send around an email once a week saying, I think a, a reasonable amount of work to do this week is the following. These are the relevant pages in the book. Here's the link to the video. Here's the link to the relevant flashcards. Um, uh, and here's a test on last week's material that you can you know, mark yourself. And I've got quite a few people taking that course. I don't know how many people take it all the way through to the end because you can subscribe to it. There's no cost or no obligation. So, you know, I've got several hundred people subscribed and I don't think that several hundred people are doing all the work. Um, but yeah, so in short, sorry, I go on for far too long. In short, the idea was to create something that comes as close to um, a, an in-person teaching environment as possible, as learning with a teacher as possible. Fantastic. It really is, um, because it is an offer that, you know, becomes ever rarer around the world to be able to learn Sanskrit, especially at your own pace and nowadays necessarily at long distance. Um, and as you've said, the, the notion of uh, speed or tempo or pacing is very important. And we see the various textbooks addressing that sort of question differently, depending at which audience they're directed. Mm. Sort of school books in Latin or Greek, for instance, will be paced far far more slowly than sort of a, an intensive course that you might have at university to get you to sort of a decent level to be able to use those languages. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Um, now, um, you've already mentioned to a certain extent um, my next question, namely uh, to what uh, degree your own experience as a Sanskrit learner and then as a Sanskrit teacher has influenced the, the structuring, the uh, degree of detail in your book and in general, sort of the, the makeup of it. Is there anything mm. you'd like to add to that? Um, I, th I think I've been really, really fortunate that um, I was basically writing that book while I was, um, you know, uh, a, a very active, you know, full-time teacher of ancient languages at Cornell because um, I had the, the perfect guinea pigs um, and I had guinea pigs who actually enjoyed being guinea pigs because <laughs> them being guinea pigs meant that, um, you know, if they, if they asked a question and it was about something that I hadn't addressed yet, then, um, a, you know, uh, uh, I would have a, a great, um, I wouldn't just be able to you know, give them an answer, but I would then also have an incentive for coming up with a sort of nicely layouted, nicely sort of complete um, description of the whole thing in writing that they could then take with them. And that would then make you know, part of chapter 25 in what later on turned out to be the book. Um, so it was, um, uh, yeah, the, the way that I wrote the book was hugely influenced by um, what, I, what my students showed me on a daily basis they needed. Um, I originally started teaching um, with a book that I had learned Sanskrit from. So I'm, uh, I, 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 uh, I'm mostly self-taught. I used um, Coulson's Teach Yourself Sanskrit. 
which was great for me because basically it's the kind of book that if you know Latin and Greek and also a little bit of you know German and French is is great and I do know these languages and so for me if someone telling me consider the augment um, is exactly what I need um, but there, so I taught from that um, and my first um, Sanskrit my you know my first year teaching Sanskrit um, I am very grateful to my students for you know sticking with it because um, I had a lot to learn um, about how to teach Sanskrit um, uh, because it's always about um, not just you know um, how you teach what the material is but also um, what your what your audience is and back then I had no idea what a 21st century um, college age audience would be like how diverse they would be how you know how many different backgrounds they would come from what kind of background knowledge you couldn't take for granted um, and so um, I just tried as much as I could to learn from them um, and that's also what I would say that you know if any if, if, any, if anybody feels that there is a need for a um, you know for a new textbook for a new introduction to something um, don't be stopped by the fact that there's already 30 or 40 ones already out there it's very possible that these um, address a, um, a market to use publisher speak um, that these address a market that is not really the, the market that you would find um, several decades later um and uh, that uh you know and, and especially with sanskrit i find that the interest the reasons for learning it have changed hugely um not just in the west and so yeah um see 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 what is needed and then try and address that particular need that's basically what what, what i did well that's what i tried to do that was that was my aim throughout this entire process I can only wholeheartedly agree from the perspective of Iranian and other Indian European languages, um, where many of the books that we find were written with a what, Indian European or Latin and Greek speaking audience mm. in mind, which in, as you say, the 21st century is a, a, a quite an ask for a number of people, especially if they come not from the classics, but maybe from history or from anthropology or theology or whatever other subject it may be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so um, one of the things that presumably because of the questions of your students uh, and your own questions you have included are little uh, historical linguistic notes um, in your book. For instance, you try to explain why in some verbs we find forms in uh, sia versus isya, um, and you then go on to explain the difference between uh, set and anit roots, um, mm -hmm. which you know, as an Indian Europeanist, I find entirely sensible. Um, <laughs> But surely, um, you know, um, that must have been one of those things that you fought over with your editor. Um, and I then ask, uh, in that context, um, what role do you personally think these little sort of historical linguistics or other linguistic notes ought to have in a book addressed to as wide an audience as possible? Yeah. Um, and um, what was sort of your publisher's perspective on, on these things and um, which things would you either in hindsight or from your perspective back then um, think were the, were the most important ones? Um, so first of all, this is something that you'll find whenever you publish something fairly um, specialized your editor won't necessarily know the subject matter that you're writing about. So they may only be able to say, you know, this is what, what um, referee one, you know, um, uh, reviewer one, reviewer two said. Um, uh, and uh, there were um, some reviewer comments, um, I would assume from reviewers who, you know, themselves did not have that kind of historical language background, who said that, well, you know, this, this isn't an introduction to, you know, historical Sanskrit phonology, this is meant to be a Sanskrit textbook. Um, and uh, so um, I, there were a few small notes that I, that I left out that um, um, I then basically kind of added back in in the videos and whenever I teach, because I find that um, if you do it well, um, and if you sort of preface it with, now this is a historical explanation for those who find it useful, you know, everybody else, take a break, get something to drink, pet your cat. Um, if, you, if you preface it in that way, um, then, then these things um, basically always are very, very useful. Obviously, you can't do that in a book, but in a book, the, the, the visual equivalent to take a break, get something to drink, would be to do what I then tried to do by um, 
So I'm, I'm indenting the historical explanations um, and I mark them as, you know, this is just a historical excursus. And for the most part, they are, they are printed in, in, in gray. So to indicate this is something that some will find helpful and others won't. And it's something that you can definitely leave, leave aside if you prefer. Um, and so I think basically what I now that I've seen, um, you know, that, that I've seen the success of the book and um, that I've got, you know, loads and loads of reactions from students, I think I would probably have put a little more um, of that his, of those historical explanations in. Um, I, I would always still just, you know, limit them to the bits that are, um, that are really, that are really needed. Um, so if there's if there is if there is a great if there's a significant function they have so um, because for example what you are mentioning so said and Anid roots roots um, and so you know uh, future and Sia or Ishia these are things that students will notice and that they will ask about um, and um, if so if the, on the one hand they refer to um, really noticeable phenomena in the language and on the other hand can be explained with um, a not overwhelming amount of background detail, then I will then I will include them. But even then, I will always say this is the kind of bit that you know is historical background that you can ignore if you want to. And the, the middle ground is that you can do at least when you're when you're when you're actually teaching. Um, you know, in front of students, so rare these days, um, uh, but it, it can be done over Zoom as well. Um, that if a student asks and you say there are historical reasons. And then you can see whether the student goes, ah, and then you explain the historical reasons, or whether the student goes, ah, okay, okay, and then you just leave it at that. And, yeah. Fantastic. That, that's um, sort of literally hearkening back to things that I've said in our seminar, how important it is to <laughs> um, read your audience on the one hand, and if you're going for a historical or any other kind of explanation to make sure that it's not gratuitous, but functional, right? You, yeah, they don't, exactly. you don't need overwhelming detail, but it's just something that even if it is simplification from a linguistic perspective, uh, that will get you through your material. Excellent. And of course, um, coming to all the points you would like to have included, uh, that's for the second edition, um, as it were. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, we are almost at the end of the, the question that I've prepared. Um, and so I'll um, just ask you one more thing that I think will be quite interesting for um, basically any listener uh, or viewer, we should say. And that is, well, why do we need to learn any ancient language and Sanskrit in particular anyways? Aren't we, you know, now that it's 2,000, 3,000 years later, um, better off by just reading translations, for instance? Mm. Um. I think there's there's two levels on which to answer this language. One uh, to answer this question. One is about um, uh, you know these languages allow us ancient languages allow us to access civilizations from other times and from other places in uh, a way that basically no other medium can. Whenever you know if if you go um, there was there was an ex there were exhibitions at the British Museum. One about um, uh, Ashurbanipal and the other one about, I think, the Celts. Mm -hmm. And the Celts, we have very, very few um, uh, written, um, you know, anythings. And so that explanation, that, that exhibition was completely different from um, what we could say, you know, the amount of detail that we could infer about the society, about how the society saw itself, how, about how it wanted to be seen, how the king wanted to be seen, how people felt and so on, all these things where you could just connect to on a human level. Um, it was completely different from, from, from the, from the uh, Shobanipal exhibition solely on the basis of the fact that they had language that they wrote down and we can write that written, we can read that written language. So on the one hand, language is just very, um, uh, it, it's just really important as a, as a connector. Um, and um, I find that, um, you know, with, with Sanskrit texts, if I, if I read something that was written by, you know, someone 1500 years ago in a completely di different situation from me, and um, I see that they have the exact same worries and fears and hopes that I have, I just feel, a, you know, I just feel a human connection. And if, you, if you're growing up with that, if you're used to that, if you encounter that on a regular basis, it's a lot more difficult for some politician to go and say, ah, this is us and that is them. So now let us fight a war against them. Because you see what, you know, they're, they're people. They're like, they're, like, they're, they're, they're so similar to us. 
um, you learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about humanity, you learn a lot about, um, you know, uh, things that, that worry us greatly these days, you know, the, the word unprecedented, unprecedented gets thrown around so much in, in Corona times. Um, when you, when you write, and you write that on an individual human level, um, you know, I have never lived through a pandemic before, um, for example. But uh, you can read ancient texts. I mean, you can read Thucydides about the pandemic, you know, about the, the plague in ancient Athens, and all of a sudden you can, you can, so you can, you can see how humans have gone through these things before, how they have coped with them before. You can see how they have they have adapted to difficult things before. Um, so basically, literature, um, you know, has just this greatly, I find, humanizing factor. Um, so that's why I find it extremely important to just read, to be able to to read ancient literature. Um, and with any translation, um, so you're right, one can read many of these things in translation, um, but the, um, uh, the point is that there is, there is always something lost in translation, you know, that's why we've even got that as a saying, um, uh, um, no matter which language you're talking about, um, because um, uh, literary language is language as art and not just to convey contents, but to convey contents in a particular form. And very often to translate the co combination of contents and form into another language is just really difficult. I mean, anybody who reads Harry Potter and German will not get half of the jokes because they just weren't translated. And this is from, you know, neighboring countries existing at the same time. Um, with Sanskrit, I think the situation is, 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 is exacerbated because um, um, A, there are many, many, many texts that just have never been translated into, into any other language, let alone um, a Western European language or anything that any of us might have had um, access to or, or contact with. Um, then there is the fact that um, in Sanskrit, um, the, uh, ambiguity um, basically is a uh, um, is used as a as a stylistic means, and but they use it as a, as a complete art form. So Schlesia is what it's called, and you will often have entire um, stanzas or entire passages that could be read on the one hand as a nice and beautiful nature description, or could be a rather steamy love scene, um, depending on you know how how you read them. Um, and sometimes you know there's the contrast between two different things or, or dif uh, um, ambiguity on on two different levels um, in using areas completely other than nature and text. This is just sort of an example that that, that I was just thinking of. Um, and to try, it's impossible to, it's absolutely impossible to translate that no matter how good a translator you are, no matter how well you know Sanskrit and your own language, um, the, the, even the best translators resort to putting the, these passages into um, uh, italics and then saying, could mean this, dash, or life, you know, it could mean that. Um, and, and lastly, for Sanskrit, I find that um, uh, like Latin, it is the language of a relatively big faith, you know, so Latin is used in the, in the Catholic Church, Sanskrit is used um, by a variety of religions, but especially by, by Hindus. And um, um, in modern India, you've got a fairly strong revival of Sanskrit as kind of, um, you know, to be Sanskrit is, you know, Sanskritic culture is, is what we need to focus on, this is what unites us all, i.e., you know, this is our way to exclude all the Muslims as non-Indian. Um, and um, you get all these statements about, you know, the Veda says this, the Vedas say this, Kalidasa says that, um, uh, you know, this kind of, this, this branch of philosophy will, will argue this way and so on. And um, so it's actually really, really useful to um, be able to um, teach people Sanskrit who will then go to their scriptures or other historically and culturally important texts and will then be able to see what those texts actually say that um, very often a statement that is made very, very clearly in, um, for example, there's this great translation, the Bhagavad Gita as it is, which makes the Bhagavad Gita out to be very, very clear in all sorts of verses where, you know, there is beautiful ambiguity where you can, um, you know, if you read it in this way and can be happy, great. If you read it in that way and can be happy, great. That's the point of the text that different people with different backgrounds and different goals can live their life in a, way that is good for them and useful for society. It's not meant to impose one view on an entire population. If you don't know Sanskrit, you kind of have to take these people at, at their word and there's nothing you can do. 
if you do know Sanskrit, then you can say, ah, oh, but you know, what about this? What about that? This compound, it could be uh, a Dvandva, it could, however, also be a Tatpurusha. And all of a sudden you've got a completely different interpretation. So I find it odd, but I uh, but I found that you know teaching Sanskrit is a political activity, and so yeah. <laughs> well, that uh, if there needs to be any addition to this uh, extrapolation of all the reasons to learn ancient languages and particularly Sanskrit, I don't know what it would be. <laughs> uh, th thank you for for that. That's very very useful and indeed very very topical also in these um, new times. Let's say. <laughs> Yes, in, 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 in the, the, the current normal. Yes, um, uh, I, I've heard this morning the phrase BC before COVID. Before Corona. Yeah. Um, oh, well. Yes. Anyway, um, is there anything you th would like to add that I haven't asked you about? Anything that comes to mind that ought to be said about Sanskrit or about writing a textbook for Sanskrit? Um, especially if you've got experience, go with your gut. If a reviewer tells you, no, this is no good. And the first set of reviews that I had were weird. Um, then basically, if you can explain why you're doing what you're doing, go with it. You know, if, you, if you're trying to get your, if you're trying to write a textbook, if you're trying to get it published, um, you can always do a, a detailed author's reply. Um, don't just um, take negative criticism, uh, you know, sort of as, as something that cannot, that, that is of criticism, that as something that cannot be changed. Um, if, you, if you are able to explain why you're doing something the way you're doing, usually your editor will, will, will understand and will go with that. And sometimes you're trying to write down an explanation of why you're doing something the way you're doing, and you realize, actually, the reviewer is right. And then, of course, you know, you're very grateful that your reviewer just made your book better. Um, but basically, you know, stick, stick, stick with your gut. If you've got, if you've got experience teaching, um, then that, that is basically what you need in order to, to, to write a textbook. And um, in academia, teaching doesn't have a very high value. And so many people who are very high up, um, who would, for example, be asked to, you know, review books for, especially for the more prestigious presses, um, are often the people who would never have taught introductory Sanskrit, or maybe have taught it once when they were a graduate student, and then after that they, they started teaching, you know, some more worthy things like um, philosophical texts and so on. So if you have, if you have um, experience teaching introductory language or te teaching, you know, whatever it is that you want to write a book about, um, don't feel that um, if someone on a higher level says, no, you're absolutely wrong, that they necessarily um, are right in what they're saying. So one of the criticisms that um, an anonymous reviewer gave me for so when when I was trying to get it published with with CUP was um, you know this book this book introduces material this book introduces grammar piecemeal that is not pedagogy and and I was sort of like well, what what else are you supposed to do just sort of give someone a you know a, 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 a grammar and say you know take it and read you know you have you have to you have to break it down you have to find ways of um you know explaining things so that they are correct but limited to the material you're trying to introduce even though you as the teacher are fully aware that you are not including certain bits in the picture that you're then going to add later on but first of all you want to ex you want to introduce for example the more frequent verb conjugations or more regular noun declensions um, and not giving someone the complete picture, especially when it comes to something like, like, like Sandy. Um, I actually tried to um, follow the example of the books that I'd seen prior, you know, um, before I wrote my own book, um, that mostly were introducing Sandy A in one go. Um, and so Sandy is basically a, a fairly intricate set of rules of what happens when one sound meets another inside a word and between words. Um, and um, I tried to introduce it all at once and it was just a disaster. I mean, no one actually cried, but I could see that they were getting very, very close. And so next, next time I, I brought them brownies and, and said, okay, we get it. we're gonna take a step back now. Um, and so uh, I saw that what I was doing because I thought, well, you know, that's the thing, the established thing to do. That may not necessarily be the right way because we've always done it that way, may not necessarily be a good reason for continuing to do it that way. Exactly. I will so, add, yeah. sorry, I will, I will add here my, my own experience of being 
told when I learned Sanskrit many years ago that, you know, Sandhi is the point at which you can tell whether someone will learn the language or will fail to learn the language. Uh, because, as you say, if it is presented in this big block of uh, rules and nothingness, uh, it, it is, can be a sort of a deal breaker, as it were. Yeah, exactly. And and what I would like to do is for, for, for teaching resources to be the sort of thing that will take anybody who wants to, you no know, matter their, their you know, um, prior knowledge or ability or whatnot, uh, who will take them beyond that step. So we'll take them beyond Sunday. Exactly. For example. And, here, and here we come back to the, uh, I think, well-established pedagogical principle of the sort of zone of proximal development to say that, you know, you have to challenge your student without overwhelming them and exactly. find material and ways of introducing new material that are appropriate to the stage of their learning that they are currently at. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for your time and uh, for sharing your experience both of learning and teaching Sanskrit as well as of writing a textbook <laughs> of Sanskrit. Um, I would uh, also suggest that you give yourself a plug here and talk about your uh, other program for a moment, if you like. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, so um, just as a couple of years ago, I felt that there was a need for a, a new Sanskrit textbook. Um, I've now in the past couple of years felt that there is a need for a new Sanskrit reader. And by reader, I mean um, a book that allows you to make your first experiences of reading you know, Sanskrit texts in the original in continuous and longer passages. Because um, in an introductory language course, you kind of learn the skills. So, you know, you're introduced to all the grammar that, that, that is relevant. And then um, the next step is building up stamina. And building up stamina means reading lots and lots of texts. And I feel that that sort of thing, um, uh, you know, you only, you only really learn how to read a literary language by actually reading it a lot. And you will only read it a lot if the process is ideally fun or at least pain-free. Um, and so what I've done is basically try and make the process as pain-free as possible because the two main sources of pain are that you constantly need to look up lots and lots and lots and lots of vocab. Um, you know, even if you've got a certain basic vocabulary, um, you will have to look up every second word when you start reading. And secondly, there will be lots of grammar that you may already know, but you haven't seen it in a while. And so you would have to look it up. You know, you'd have to identify what it is that you can't identify find it in a grammar and then you know come back to the sentence and when you need 15 minutes 30 minutes to translate a verse it's not fun so basically what i've been doing is i've been writing a um, sanskrit reader that um, does these two things it uh, has uh, an, an apparatus of vocabulary and so a set of vocabulary um, all the words that you're most likely to have to look up and a set of grammatical explanations for basically all the more complicated grammar all on the same page um, and the um, text itself will be laid out in such a way that there will be lots of margin, lots of space between the lines to scribble all your notes in, because we all do that and we all need to do that. Um, and so the idea is that um, you can then, you will still have to look things up, but you will just have to look down to the bottom of the page to look them up. And then you go back up um, and you will be able to read things and translate them much more easily, much more quickly, much more fluently. Um, and to make sure that any gaps in vocabulary aren't keeping you back, um, I then am putting on the publisher's website a um, basically complete vocabulary of each passage of each story. Um, and um, when I started writing um, this, this, this reader, people were like, why? There's so many readers already out there. Um, and the reason why everybody keeps using the one reader from the 1880s is because even though that is um, outdated in many ways and expects its readers to know Latin and Greek and everything, you know, a Harvard student would know in the 1880s, um, is it's basically the only reader that has um, vocabulary list and grammatical comments. There's lots of other readers that basically are sort of Christomathies, which are beautiful connections of text, but with hardly any, any sort of anything to help the reader. And so um, that reader is, hopefully, fingers crossed, going to come out in 2021 with brill with with brill however it is going to be published as a in in their textbook series which means that you will not have to sell your firstborn and or kidney to be able to afford it <laughs>
Excellent. That is fantastic <laughs> news on all fronts, both in terms of pedagogy for making the students or learners' lives as easy as possible and as fun as possible, uh, whilst not breaking their bank either. Well, on that fantastic note, uh, thank you ever so much again, Antonia, Dr. Antonia Ruppel uh, of the University of Munich, Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich and of the University of Oxford. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Take care.